Welcome back to Dinner with Friends, Galentine's Day part two. If you haven't seen part one yet, I recommend watching that first before you watch this video. In part one, I did all of the prep work for our Galentine's Day lunch. I made the pasta sauce for our ziti. I made some homemade pesto and I set the table. So in this episode, I kind of try to get my shit together. Um, Again, it's a Galentine's Day lunch, so my friends are coming over at one o'clock and a lot of stuff needs to get done before one o'clock. So let the games begin. Okay, we seriously lucked out at Trader Joe's. I got all of these ranunculuses and these beautiful garden roses. So I'm just gonna trim them now. Now I am not a florist by any means, but I do know a few tricks. Now with flowers like ranunculuses or any flowers that come with leaves or secondary buds, like these little guys here, you're gonna wanna trim those off. And that is because since these flowers are no longer connected to the original plant, buds this size will literally never bloom. So they're really just dead weight on your flower. And if you want the main flower to live as long as possible and get big and beautiful, you need to trim off the extra stems. Okay, let's see how these guys are doing. They're fine. It's fine, everything is fine. But we could give them a little boost with these ranunculuses. Wow, that's, that's compelling. No, because this is literally my favorite floral arrangement I've ever done. And it's funny because I almost backed out of using the disco balls. I was like, oh, it's just gonna be too stressful. I'm gonna be too worried about them falling over. But I'm so glad I did. It looks so fun. Wow, obsessed. Obsessed, obsessed, obsessed. I think I have to go back to the kitchen, which is sad because I wish I could play with flowers in here for forever and just like not make any food. That would be so fun for me. I really don't know what to do with these roses, but I'm hoping I can just put them in here. Oh, I hate it. Oops, I hate it. Okay, well, I can't spend too much time on this. I've got work to do. I, okay, I actually think this is really adorable. I can't lie. Oh my God, it's perfect. Wow, okay, I'm gonna put him on the coffee table. Now, time for the ranunculuses. I'm gonna use this vase, but just, Give these a trim. All right, BRB. There she is, stunning, beautiful, gorgeous. Um, all right, now I'm going to get ready to start cooking. Yay. It's 9.45. Whenever I'm starting a big to-do list, whether it's a cooking to-do list or a life to-do list, a good rule of thumb is to always do the task you're dreading the most first and get that out of the way. So then you don't have it in the back of your head, like stressing you out. Something that's been stressing me out is transferring this cake to a cake stand. And so I'm gonna just knock that out now so we can go on living our life. Again, this cake was sent to me by Gold Belly from the Martha Stewart team. It's her strawberry rose cake. So you'll see it looks like a rose on top. Perfect for Valentine's Day, perfect for Galentine's Day. So obviously I couldn't pass this up. If you tuned in to our last episode, you know that baking cakes is something I'm retiring from for the foreseeable future. Ooh, yeah. Maybe I should have not taken her out of the fridge before doing this. I probably should have read the directions, but that's okay. It's fine, everything is fine. So here I'm just smoothing out the frosting with a bench scraper. Okay, she looks great. Yum. Okay, make room. Martha's cake coming through. Da 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 da. We are going to make a pomodoro sauce for our baked gnocchi. I'm doing baked gnocchi alla sorrentina, which is essentially a fresh 
tomato sauce. In this case, I'm doing a Pomodoro sauce with cherry tomatoes. Um, and it's just the gnocchi suspended in that fresh tomato sauce with fresh mozzarella and fresh basil. It's kind of like if you combined gnocchi with a margarita pizza. It's my favorite way to eat gnocchi, gnocchi alla sorrentina. Um, and I think it's gonna be perfect for the party. Okay, we have our peeled garlic and now I'm going to microplane the garlic. So we get thinly sliced garlic chips. You could use a knife, but this just makes it easier and faster. Just go slow. And then also if you go like this, you're not gonna get a finger. Okay, we are going to start off our sauce with lots of olive oil. We have our super thinly sliced garlic, literally like paper thin. I'm gonna throw that in here. We don't want the oil to be too hot when we add the garlic because it'll burn. So you almost wanna add it in while the oil's still cold. The garlic is super sticky. So it's all sticking together, but you wanna like spread it around, get it all nice and coated in that olive oil. Wanna keep a close eye on it. Got some red pepper flakes. Just a little, you don't want the sauce to be spicy, but you wanna add a little bit of heat. Some salt. Then I have three cans of cherry tomatoes. They're all different brands because I just like raided my pantry. But this is my favorite brand of canned cherry tomatoes. So delicious, so sweet. And I love the texture you get from the little pops of tomato. And I kind of want to get a close up. I'm going to add basil stems because that's going to perfume the sauce with the flavor of basil. And then we'll pull them out before we add the gnocchi. All right, just as our garlic is starting to turn golden brown, we're going to add our cherry tomatoes. Since these are three different brands, the cherry tomatoes are probably gonna be a few different sizes, but that's okay. Wow. Gorge. While our sauce is reducing, I'm going to make a quick little marinade for some little balls of mozzarella to go on our antipasto board. I just have some garlic and finely chopped chives in here, but you can use any fresh herb I just had some chives that needed to be used up. And I'm doing some olive oil, some delicious, beautiful Partana olive oil, oregano. Crush that up in my hands, make a mess. Yum. Some black pepper, salt, and that's it. I mean, I could go crazy, but I don't feel like it. You wanna stir this as it reduces and make sure it's not scorching at the bottom. I have a little bit of stickage here, but just scrape it up. Let that keep doing its thing. So these are literally just little balls of mozzarella that I got from Whole Foods, because they were on sale. Two containers of those little mozzarella balls, our marinade. Now we have marinated mozzarella. Now I'm gonna keep these out at room temperature actually, so that they're nice and soft and tender by the time we're setting up our antipasto board. But yeah, you wanna get them all nice and coated in that delicious olive oil. Give it a little shake every now and then, but I'm just gonna let this sit over there on the counter. Are we done? How long have we been cooking this for? Like 15 minutes? I'm like kind of over this and it's getting all over the kitchen. <sighs> I literally just cleaned this whole kitchen and now it's covered in splatters of tomato. I think we're like ready to rock and roll with this. I get these from Italy, they're little potato gnocchis. Now the old me would have insisted on making homemade gnocchi, but I'm mature enough to realize that that would make my life worse and none of my guests would notice. I'm gonna remove the basil stems. Don't worry, we're gonna add more basil. I love basil! If I could use one herb for the rest of my life, it would be parsley if I was being practical, but if I was being indulgent and selfish, I would do basil. I also love tarragon. I'm really resisting the urge to put butter in this sauce, but I know it doesn't need butter, but I know if I added butter, it would taste pretty good. We're gonna drop our gnocchi. I'm gonna cook them for like, probably like a minute, and then we'll transfer them directly into the sauce. Gnocchi in! 
Since we're baking this, I don't really have to worry too much if the gnocchi is 100% fully cooked because it's gonna continue to cook in the oven. I really just wanna give them a head start. All right, they're starting to float to the top. Gnocchi is going in. You don't want them to be overcooked because then they'll like fall apart in the sauce. Gorge, gorge, gorge. I am scraping the sides to get that tomato sauce off the sides. All right, I'm gonna throw in some parm. I actually might add a cup of pasta water just so this doesn't get too tight in the oven. You want it to be like a little saucy. We don't want to serve some dry ass gnocchi. There, nice and saucy. And now I have fresh mozzarella that I'm gonna scatter over top. Lots of mozz. If I wasn't filming a cooking show, I would leave this like this on the countertop and then bake it right before serving. But since I'm filming a cooking show, I'm gonna throw it in the oven now so then we can get some photos of the finished dish before people get here. Um, and then I'll just reheat it when it comes time to sit down to eat. I'm gonna go ahead and drizzle her with some olive oil, Calabrian chili olive oil, I think, yeah. Cause why not? There she is. I'm gonna throw her in the oven at 400 and bake just until the cheese is melted. Something that I mentioned during part one that I would like to elaborate on is my disdain for pre-grated or pre-shredded cheeses. This is not because I'm pretentious, this is truly science. So let me explain. Pre-grated shelf-stable cheese is typically coated in starches to prevent it from clumping up in the bag. It also helps prevent molding from occurring and prolongs the shelf life. However, these starches then prevent the cheese from melting properly. So I always recommend grating your cheese yourself, especially when you are melting cheese into a sauce, like cacio e pepe, or in this case, our ziti alla tzotzona. Using pre-grated parm will give you a lumpy, clumpy, weird texture in your sauce. It won't melt, like it won't fully melt all the way. So you need to use the freshly grated stuff. Now you can buy pre-grated parm from the cheese counter at your grocery store. Usually they freshly grate it in-house either that day or whatever. Just be sure to check the label for any additives and make sure that it's literally just cheese. Now, I'm not a monster. I'm not saying that you can never buy pre-grated cheese ever again for the rest of your life. I still sometimes buy pre-grated cheese. When we can use it is if we're just sprinkling it on top of stuff. Yes, it'll have that chalky consistency and kind of a weird flavor, but it's not gonna make or break your dish. Like in the video, you'll see I use pre-grated mozzarella. Now, the reason I am using pre-grated mozzarella is because I ordered a block of mozzarella on Instacart and the guy brought me a bag of pre-grated mozzarella and I didn't wanna waste it. So I used it, it worked out fine. Like it's really not that big of a deal. You can use pre-grated cheese in quesadillas. Like it's it's not like black and white. It's a, there's a very large gray area, but when it comes to Parmesan cheese specifically, always grate your own. However, sometimes I like to indulge in one of those like <laughs> plastic canisters of Parmesan cheese in the non-refrigerated aisle that you keep in the door of your fridge for like years and years and years. I still love that stuff. I put it on my pizza, I put it on my buttered noodles. Don't throw her out, but like just know when she's appropriate and when she's not appropriate. All right, we're gonna talk about the ziti now. We made our tomato sauce yesterday, but we need to do our egg yolk emulsion. I am using these tubular noodles, but very key, they are bronze cut, so they're textured on the outside and they're also like ridged. They have the ridges um, to catch all that sauce. My pet peeve is a ziti noodle that's like flat on the outside, smooth. A smooth ziti noodle should be illegal. We're pacing a little bit behind where I want it to be at this moment, but it's gonna be fine. My goal for the ziti is to put it in this massive tray so we have maximum surface area, maximum crispy bits. I'm gonna now crack some egg yolks into a bowl. Oh my God, it's so hot over here. 
six egg yolks and two thirds cup of pecorino. And then I'm gonna throw in lots of black pepper. whisk -a doodle So technically this bag is two pounds of pasta. I just dumped it out to see if this is enough pasta to cover the entire tray and it kind of is. All right, this is going in the salted water. All right, timer, 10 minutes maybe. Okay, like the gnocchi, we wanna undercook this ziti. I also want tons of pasta water. Now I'm also gonna temper these eggs. This is gonna prevent the eggs from scrambling when I add them later. Okay, I need to strain this. Add our sauce. Oh my gosh. Pasta. Pasta water. Oh my God, I don't even know if you can see what I'm doing. I'm just like trying to go as quickly as possible. Pasta water in. Coat the nudes. I'm gonna add our egg mixture. The heat is off. The residual heat from the pan is gonna continue to cook those eggs into like a custard. Diluted enough, they're not gonna scramble. Sorry, I'm talking to myself. Can you even see? I'm so sorry. It's really saucy, which is what we want because that sauce is gonna tighten up a lot when we bake it. You wanna make sure every single noodle is individually coated with that sauce. Time to do the transfer. Holy moly. More pecorino. And then I'm gonna do some whole milk mozzarella and do a nice light, even layer. That looks great. I think we're gonna throw her in now, just long enough to get it melted and picture perfect so I can take pictures of her. Going in! Don't recommend throwing a red lip into the mix when you're already stressed for time and you haven't done one in maybe three years. Uh, not really sure what these b -b -b bangs are doing, but do we hate them? Kinda. <laughs> time to pull the Z. The key to assembling a good grazing board is contrast. You want various flavors, textures, colors, shapes, sizes, temperatures. It doesn't matter what kind of grazing board you're making, like whether it's a cheese board that's like French and has a bunch of cheeses and jams and pâtés and spreads, or in this case, an Italian grazing board. I hate like using the word grazing board like this so flippantly because it's like, it's antipasto, but they all kind of fall in the same category of like platters of little snacks that all kind of go together and that you can pick at. And all of the different cuisines in the globe have some variation of this like snack grazing situation. And these rules apply to all of those. These rules apply low key to like food in general, but specifically in grazing boards because it's a bit more obvious. Let me explain. In my grazing board, my antipasto grazing board, I did some contrasting cheeses. I did a mozzarella, which is a fresh, soft cheese. And then I did an aged, firm, salty cheese. I forget the name. You see the contrast there? Then for a fresh vegetal component, I did fire roasted tomatoes and grilled artichokes. For a crunchy component, I did breadsticks, olive crackers, and corn nuts. And then for a savory, salty component, I did prosciutto. And then for a sweet component, I did Calabrian chili jam. So not only do we have contrasting flavors like sweet and salty, we also have contrasting textures like soft and crunchy. You see what I'm saying? And then oftentimes when I have a grazing board situation, I'll also do what I call a crowd pleaser. And that's usually a snack item that sometimes has nothing to do with the grazing board itself, but I know that people are gonna eat it. In this case, I did a bowl of popcorn. Popcorn has nothing to do with antipasto, but I know my friends love popcorn and I know that they're gonna eat it. Um, sometimes I'll do potato chips, sometimes I'll do Cheetos. We love junk food here in this house. 
it's not that serious. You don't have to like be so strict with it, but just keep in mind contrast. Okay, hi. My friends are gonna be here any minute. I have not set up the antipasto yet, but we're gonna do that now. Okay, first things first, our marinated mozzarella balls. Yaishta, gorgeous. And then I also have some marinated roasted, fire roasted tomatoes and roasted garlic. Ooh, yeah. Oh, I forgot, I have these beautiful artichokes. Mmm. Yum. And I'm gonna save all these containers in case we don't eat everything. Corn nuts. Oh, and then I have that hard cheese and then the meats and then that's it. I also put some popcorn out in case people arrived before I had time to do this. Um, what did I just say I was gonna do? Cheese. This is a cow's milk cheese that's aged in Merlot, which is a sweet red wine. I think that'll be a nice addition to the board. So I have a really big family and we have like 30 to 50 people at Thanksgiving every year and everyone has their own little task that they're responsible for. And my family has been responsible for doing the cheese board for the past like decade. So my parents are very knowledgeable in cheese and I have gotten that knowledge from them. I actually don't know a ton about this particular cheese that I'm cutting up right now, but I wanted to try something new. Mm. Ooh, it's a little sharp too. There's some like crystallized little crystals in there, like you'd get in a parm. I'm gonna assemble it on this table so that I don't have to carry it and potentially spill everything everywhere. It's 12.50, people are supposed to come over at one. Should I put a movie on? Don't try it out at home. I've had the prosciutto sitting out at room temp for 30 minutes or so, so that it's not all stuck together. You want prosciutto to be nice and room temp because it's all that beautiful pork fat that you want, like not ice cold. Okay, whoever sliced this prosciutto low-key butchered it and I'm like a little pissed about it, but I'll forgive them. I used to have to slice the cured meats at the restaurant I used to work at. I would have to go all the way upstairs into the attic with the meat slicer that literally weighed like 200 pounds. And it's like one of those things where if you use it incorrectly, you will lose an entire arm. Like it's so powerful and so sharp. And I would be up there by myself slicing and if I slice my finger, like no one would find me for days. Oh, I also totally forgot to tell you. After I finished filming last night, I made the salad dressing. It's just a balsamic vinaigrette. Okay, so this salad was inspired by the beautiful assortment of radicchio that I found at the store. If you're unfamiliar, radicchio is a leafy vegetable. Its peak season is right about now. So like end of fall through the winter, you can eat it raw like you would any other leafy vegetable but it's also sturdy enough for cooked preparations that you might do with like a cabbage. Its flavor profile is similar to arugula in that it's slightly bitter and peppery, but it has a great crunch to it like you would get in a romaine, which honestly is like the best of both worlds in my opinion. I used three varieties of radicchio in this salad. I'm going to list them here because I cannot pronounce them correctly. Since radicchio is slightly bitter, I like to balance it out with a vinaigrette that leans on the sweet side. So here I did a balsamic vinaigrette that has sweetness naturally from that balsamic vinegar, and then also the addition of honey. And then I added some fresh figs for extra sweetness. Now, whenever I do a sweet and salty salad like this, I love to add a nice savory salty cheese. It adds a ton of umami and I think it just really ties the salad together. In this case, I used blue cheese, primarily because I had a ton of blue cheese in my fridge and I wanted to use it up. And blue cheese does go really well in this salad. However, in this particular menu, I don't think I would have used blue cheese had I not already had it on hand. And this is my reasoning. I was serving the salad as a side salad, not as a starter salad. So since it's a side salad, we're gonna be eating it along with all of the other dishes. And we already have a ton of flavors going on with all of those different pastas that throwing blue cheese into the mix just like 
feels like it's working against those flavors rather than supporting them. It's really not that big of a deal. These are things that only I am going to be thinking about, but I just wanted to say, typically, I wouldn't recommend doing blue cheese in a side salad. Unless you're doing something like steak, where it can really stand up to that funky blue cheese flavor or even like complement each other. Like steak and blue cheese, yum, delicious. Gnocchi alla sorrentina and blue cheese, no. Baked ziti and blue cheese, no. Like typically in a perfect world, I wouldn't have used blue cheese, but it tastes good in the salad. I'm not cooking for a food critic here. I just wanted to specify in a perfect world, I would have just topped this salad with Parmesan or Pecorino or Manchego, something that would support the rest of the meal rather than distract from it, for the record. My wrist hurts. I don't know why. Pause. I realized that I sprained my wrist the day before when I was opening a jar of Calabrian chilies. <laughs> Ow. Oh my God, I'm gonna sprain my wrist. I did not know that that was why my wrist was hurting until I was editing the footage and I see like me struggling with the jar and I'm like, oh my God, that's why my wrist has been hurting so much. And it's now been almost a month later and my wrist is still killing me. So if I have any physical therapists in the audience that wanna like give me some exercises to do, let me know. It hurts like right down here, like when I do that. So that's fun. Okay, for the pesto pasta, we made the pesto the day before, obviously, but when I make pesto pasta, this is how I do it. Boil your pasta until al dente, save a bunch of pasta water, put the noodles back into the pot, have the pasta water on the side. In this video, I did about a pound of pasta, and so I did two cups of pesto. Mix that in, add some pasta water, keep mixing, and then once you get to a good consistency with your pasta, turn off the heat, add three tablespoons of butter, trust, and then some extra Parmesan cheese if you want, more pasta water, mix that until the butter's melted, the cheese is melted and everything's emulsified, melty, combined, delicious, saucy, saucy sauce. And that's how you make the best pesto pasta. Far too often I see people put pesto on dry noodles, mix it to death until finally all the noodles are coated and then serve this dry ass pesto pasta. You need pasta water. You don't need butter, but you need pasta water. Like, seriously, I'm so serious. With most of the dinner parties I've ever catered, I almost always do a buffet. I don't know why people are so like averse to a buffet style of serving. I think people think of it as cheap and not elevated. Sure, I hear you. Obviously a plated dinner service is much more fancy than a buffet style dinner service. But like when it's just you and your friends, like who literally cares? Also trying to put all of those platters of food on the table and do like family style passed around is so stressful. I cannot tell you how many times I've had people insist on doing family style rather than buffet style, just to have all of their guests like struggling to like hold all of the serving dishes and having nowhere in the center of the table to put said serving dishes. Like when I would do a catering job where they're really persistent about wanting family style instead of buffet style, I'll say, okay, we can do that, but there has to be su sufficient room on the dining table for us to put the serving platters. 
I cannot tell you how many times I would show up to an event and see the tablescape and there'd be like flowers and candles and all of this shit all up in the center of the table. And also the table would be like this wide and there would be literally not a single inch of extra room to even put a, a plate for like a side salad. And you want us to have platters of food on the table? Like people don't think. That is my issue with party planners who don't do the cooking and just like hire out someone who does the catering is they don't think about the logistics of serving and eating food. They just think about how the table's gonna look. And it's so frustrating and so annoying. So that's why I always say buffet style is better. That way, if you want more food, you can go and get more food. You don't have to like pester so-and-so across the table and say, could you pass down the potatoes? Just go and grab some more potatoes. But yeah, I did buffet style. Okay, that brings us to the end of the episode. Sad. For the next episode of Dinner with Friends, I'm going to be taking us on the road. I'm gonna keep it a surprise for now, but a little hint, we are going down south, y'all. I know, it's gonna be crazy, it's gonna be fun. In the meantime, I'd love to do a YouTube video where I talk about my experience in culinary school, my career journey, as well as my cookbook that I'm currently writing that isn't gonna be out for another year. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, so if you have any questions, comments, concerns about those topics, please drop them in my comments here. Okay, thank you so much for watching. Love you literally so much, and I'll see you soon.